Thank you so much for keeping his company. A very good Monday morning to you. My name is Ederiva Hilay. I want to sample some of your responses to our social media platform before I introduce uh, the topic that is coming up next after these comments. Now, we asked you, do you think too much money is spent on political campaigns? And uh, uh, sampling some of the responses by you, we have Deno Kipli. He says, a lot of money is being used in politics. He agrees with that. A man may sacrifice the used his all money at least he or she and end up being poor. Augustine Kavithia says, not even much money, but too much. <laughs> Dengeni Kisau, Makweni County, well represented. Thank you so much for watching. Philly Jones Minor says, um, siyasa ni, ni mchezo cha, mchafu. Mtu anatumia pesa kama zote then a lot. At, at long last, uh, speed votes kumi. Okay. Funny enough, akuna ata ya family member ata moja. Uh, huh, namesake Davila, Hilary Das Vila says a lot is used. Okay. Uh, Caleb Oteba says, of course, Nakuru Nikondani. Thank you so much. Uh, then uh, Adimilo Kingori wa, wa Magumu. The face of Nyandarwa County Magumu Kinangop is well represented. Thank you so much for watching. Elvis Baraka says, that is true. A lot of money is used in political campaigns. Caleb Oteba says, yes, uh, Nakuru, thank you. Um, I think. Uh, then we have Mark Magut says, yeah, not even too much, but two years. I think uh, those are some of this, uh, some of your comments uh, or your responses to the question we ask you. Do you think a lot of money is being used in political campaigns? And some of you are agreeing with the situation. Yes, a lot of money is being used in campaigns. Now, uh, it's not time to speak matters health. We want to to know or to bring ourselves to the uh, up to speed with the latest we've been fighting covid-19 but like the minister of health has been crying out we have we have other conditions health conditions that need to be looked into and this morning we are talking about cancer i'm speaking to one and only uh, omondi ochuka he's an economist but i'm calling him uh, the ambassador for cancer he has been advocating for cancer awareness in the country and he's doing a lot Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm great, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Now, uh, cancer for a long time has been um, one of the ailments, and we can agree, we can all agree, just like corona, it right. doesn't choose who is who. Right. Uh, whether you have money or you don't. Right. If cancer strikes, it will, and it will find anyone. But even so, yeah. tell us about your story. Well, my story stretches back to 2011, that is the year I was diagnosed. I was 19 year old and I was in the first year in, in campus. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they always ask you, so how did they come to know? How were you diagnosed? Mm -hmm. Did you previously fell ill? And uh, it's very funny because I, I had no health condition that could have, you know, premeditated all that. Mm -hmm. I was just a normal kid, you know, right. just a young boy in mm -hmm. college, hoping mm -hmm. for dreams and all that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one day, I think after class, I was in the University of Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the chit chat you have with your, with your friends after class on a Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we, we were chatting and then all of a sudden, I, I just feel like my vision is blurry and I'm very tired, I'm fatigued, and then I collapse. Ooh. All right, so mm -hmm. when I wake up, I wake up in a hospital mm -hmm. and I'm being asked, what day is it? Do you know your name? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it was very strange because that is not the environment I last remember. It seems between, like a movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there's, there seems to be some blank space between mm -hmm. when I was with my friends and now that I'm in a very strange place that looks like a hospital. Right. And so the nurse tells me my name is, uh, tells me her name. Mm -hmm. And she tells me you were brought here by your friends because you collapsed. You had a seizure. Mm -hmm. And we do not know yet what would have caused the, 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 the conversion. Right. So we are doing a couple of tests, we're running a couple of tests, mm -hmm. and uh, we will let you know what we, we, we find out from your tests. Right. right. So mm -hmm. I'm told to just sit tight and all that. I am seeing I'm, I'm having a drip, the water, <laughs> the IV drip. I'm still very weak. I can't, I can't really quite comprehend. So they, 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 they take me back to sleep with a tranquilizer. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, I think, I think that they had done a couple of tests overnight 
So some of them were just trickling in. So we were waiting for the doctor to do their morning rounds. That was like in the sat on Saturday in, at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. So when the doctors come and they tell me, wow, uh, we've uh, reviewed uh, some of your results. Mm -hmm. And they seem to indicate that you could be having liver problem. Either it, it's, we do not know yet. Of oh, course, yeah, you know, doctors exactly. are very careful in terms mm -hmm. of you know, how they relay the information. Yeah. So they, they tell you that we, they don't know really yet what, what could have been the problem. But when more tests come, mm -hmm. more specific tests actually, because tests can be done generally, and then there are specific ones that are looking for a very specific issue. Right. Yeah, so they tell me they'll, they'll do a couple more tests, and then on Monday, mm -hmm. now we'll have a comprehensive report about my case. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, coming Monday, they come with the results and uh, they tell me I have liver cancer. Oh, right. Well, the yeah. results are out. Yes, results are out. You are in hospital. I'm in the hospital. And you didn't know you were in hospital until you were told you right. were brought here. Right. As a young kid yes. in college, yeah. you had dreams. Of course I did. Now you've been uh, told you have cancer of the liver. Right. How did you receive the information? Well, it was really difficult because you don't believe it. It's like a shock and disbelief. Mm -hmm. You don't imagine that, well, first of all, you know, it was really difficult because the doctors were imagining that I was sort of omitting some information about my, my health or my, my lifestyle or habit. Mm -hmm. They asked me if there is any cancer case in my family. Of course, there is not, I, that, I do, that I do remember. Mm -hmm. They asked me if I use narcotics or um, I drink alcohol. Of course, yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. So. The, the, it was really difficult for them to wrap their heads around my case because most liver cancer, first of all, it's always uh, the, oldest diag the diagnosis for liver cancer comes very late, like third stage or fourth stage when there is really nothing that can be done about it. Mm -hmm. My case was, was very, I think I, they, they called it lucky because it was the second stage. Oh. But still, they were, trying, they were trying to imagine what, what is the history, what, what, what could have caused it. Mm -hmm. Because that is very important in terms of drawing up your treatment plan. They say it's triggered by something. Yeah, but it's triggered by something. A lot of things, it could be genetics, could be history, family history. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be your lifestyle when you, uh, you, you, uh, you drink alcohol excessively. Mm -hmm. So that could, be, that could cause cirrhosis, the liver damage, and then also that could also cause cancer. All right. Yeah, so when, when they sort of realize that now oh, this guy doesn't have any history with narcotics or alcohol, Mm -hmm. They said, you know, cancer can always just occur mm -hmm. for out of nowhere, mm -hmm. you know, just, just, a mal, just like a mal malfunction of the body, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, then now we, we, we have a, a new task to look at. We, we are wondering now what do we do now that the cancer is there? Mm -hmm. What treatment plan do we draw for this guy? Right. And that is, that is now where the work is because usually dying tech, like a day, it, it can go for a stretch. Mm -hmm. They can do more specific tests and then they stage mm -hmm. the disease further. Okay. I had stage two, but now they're looking, is it spread? Is it affecting other parts of the body, mm -hmm. right? So when they did that, they drew a treatment plan for me. The other, dif the other dif difficulty that I faced during that point was my cancer was inoperable. The scan that came up showed that the tumor was at a very critical point of my liver. It was in one of the, one of the veins that are very critical in the liver. Mm -hmm. So chances that if it were done surgically, I would have not made it out of the theater. So yeah. what, what, we, what, what we drew for the treatment plan was do a series of chemotherapy mm -hmm. and uh, radiotherapy so that we can shrink the tumor and then later on we can do what is called resection. Mm -hmm. Now for most people, you, you already maybe know that liver, if you cut it, it will grow back. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was the treatment plan. Shrink right. the tumor with chemotherapy and radiotherapy and then later on resect the part that is affected mm -hmm. and then it would grow back. Uh, let me just take you back with the chemo. Right. A, a number of people, you'll, you'll hear them say the chemotherapy, I've mm. gone for the chemo. Yeah. But majority of the people out here do not know what goes on with the chemo. Yeah. If it's the therapy, you know if I had an accident, yeah. someone will try to make right. me walk. Right. What happens with the chemo? Yeah, so for people, for people talk of chemo, they get <laughs> shorted as chemo. Chemo is very, very simple, but also very complex. Mm -hmm. You just go to a booth, just like the guy sitting there on, on a couch. Mm -hmm. Sit on the couch. I, I know a lot of people have donated blood or have received blood mm -hmm. or have seen somebody or in the movies or just in real life. Mm -hmm. So they do, they hook you with, with the IV mm -hmm. on, on, on your vein somewhere. Right. It, could, it could be, most of the time they do for me here, mm -hmm. it's one of the major veins here or, the, or on, on your hand. They use a brannula to hook it on, on, on your vein. Mm -hmm. And then chemo is basically just a drug. 
all right? It, it, it's prescribed. Right. So it has a regimen that is flowing on the drip. So they could add it to water so that that water, the drips, goes into the vein directly. Mm -hmm. That is a form of chemo. Oh. That is how they do chemo. Okay. Right. Now, uh, with your whole life planned out, right. you know, I want to do this course, I want to be this person when I finish school, right. this is my life. Right. And now you are seated somewhere with, uh, having the chemos. How is your mental wellness at that point? Well, I think all, most, most cancer survivors find it really difficult, the beginning, mm -hmm. when you get the diagnosis and the beginning of your treatment. Mm -hmm. That is the point where most cancer survivors usually succumb. Mm -hmm. or actually they begin to have challenges with their mental health. Mm -hmm. So to be honest, really, I was really disoriented because you have your life planned out. You're young, you're wondering why would the cancer happen to a 19 year old mm -hmm. who, you know, for a long time, there's this notion that cancer affects those people that cause it. P people who have cancer caused it or did something to warrant that disease. Oh, yeah. Like, for example, liver, liver cancer is very stigmatized as, as a disease for those people who drink excessively. Yeah. But now I am here, I'm wondering, I don't drink, I don't use alcohol, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't smoke. Mm -hmm. why, why do I have cancer? So there is that why question about, the why question is what most cancer survivors go through. They yeah. ask the same, why, why, why me? Why right. do I have this disease, all right? Mm -hmm. So I think I also went through that period where I was questioning why the cancer was happening to me mm -hmm. and, and if I will make it and if it will affect my dreams. I really wanted to be in the academia. Like, so I had a lot, a lot planned for my life ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so, but now I, I, I'm having chemo. I was actually, during the first semester and the second semester of my, of my year one, I was struggling with chemo and studies at the same time mm -hmm. because I was still clinging and I was still in denial mm -hmm. of me deferring studies mm -hmm. until a point where I, I couldn't anymore and I had to be, I went into coma, I think around 2012 in July. Mm -hmm. So that is the point where I deferred for the very first time. Right. So that was difficult for me. When I woke up after, I think it was around 43 days during that coma, mm -hmm. it hit me so bad. That is the time I was clinically depressed mm -hmm. and I was still in denial of the fact that you know I can't continue with studies anymore. Right. Uh, and I was having this inevitable thought that I might die soon. It is a thought that comes, you don't know exactly because, okay, you're having treatment, so chances, chances are you could get better. Mm -hmm. But on the other side is you might not make it. So it, it actually bothers you. Right. Yeah, so I went through therapy and it was really okay. During 2013, I'd already gotten over the why question. I'm already strong. I was, I was already grounded. Mm -hmm. I knew this is now my new reality. That is where the point comes with acceptance. Yeah. yeah and I also, one interesting fact to note about like, any chronic illness, maybe HIV or diabetes, when you're diagnosed, mm -hmm. usually it's, it's more like grief. You lo it's like you're mourning mm -hmm. you that was before. Right. Yeah, you're mourning your dreams, you're mourning your normal health. Yeah. Because right now, if somebody looks at you, you're, like, you, you're looking okay, but now you're given a diagnosis that is really difficult to go through. The cancer is expensive, it's costly to treat, mm. it affects your body. Chemo, like I, I didn't mention, chemo is very, chemo is like poison. It's meant to okay. kill the tumor, oh, but yeah. at the same time, it might end up killing the good cells in your body, mm -hmm. and that affects you, right? right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, one of the ways it affected me, it's like I lost my hair, it was really tragic for me. You go to the bathroom and when you wash your hair, the hair falls off by itself. Yeah. So that can be really scary. You're imagining how, what else is, 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 it, is it affecting in the body? Yeah. So all these things compounded together can actually have a toll on the mental health of the patient or, this, or, or the new, newly diagnosed cancer mm -hmm. patient. And uh, at the time uh, when now you, you stress, you feel depressed, yeah. uh, did you seek counseling or th who was your support system? That my time? support system, you know, it took a long time because mostly, uh, mostly I had only my grandmother. Okay. That's like my, my family. Mm -hmm. So it, it was very difficult because I'm, 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 I'm doing, I don't know what it's called, ethics or what, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm trying to imagine my grandmother is almost 80 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm the person who's actually supposed to support her at the moment. So I was wondering how do I break the news to her yeah. without like really breaking her heart. Mm -hmm. So it took me quite some time. When I started treatment, that is, when I, that is almost like two, three months after, after my diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I took some time reflecting and all that, just mm -hmm. looking at every possibility and just getting myself ready. I never wanted to go into treatment mm -hmm. when I am still weak and still doubting. Mm -hmm. Because one thing about healing, healing a lot happens from within. Mm -hmm. when, when, when a patient is, is broken from within, chances are the healing and the treatment mm -hmm. plan might not really work because mm -hmm. they're dealing with 
a turmoil inside. Mm -hmm. And therefore, either the drug is going to weaken them further or they're going to not believe the healing process. Mm -hmm. So I wanted, to, I wanted to actually grant myself on that. Mm -hmm. So when I broke the news to her, it was obviously devastating for her. Mm -hmm. But eventually, you, you know, you have to accept, you know, and yeah, yeah. just move further. Okay. Yeah, so I, 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 sought, uh, I sought therapy mm -hmm. yeah, for a year. And that actually helped me in terms of grounding myself back to accepting the reality that they, that is and now getting ready for what what is supposed to be done in the future yeah right let's talk about um, the social fabrics when you were in school your friends took you to hospital right. of course they didn't know what was your problem right. but now later mm -hmm. after now the people around you realized you have cancer yeah. how have they been uh, mm -hmm. for the last say nine years mm -hmm. okay it's, it's it's very interesting because just like just like a normal journey for a normal person who's, who's not sick mm -hmm. There is always inflow and outflow of friendship and support system, mm -hmm. uh, but we know that when a disease like cancer, it's very it's very challenging mm -hmm. the way it affects you because right now I'm in 2012 I'm not going to school, so you don't meet your friends often. Mm -hmm. They're wondering where did this guy go. Mm -hmm. Some of them know exactly what you're going through and they're, they're becoming more intimate with you. They show support. They visit you mm -hmm. uh, when you're admitted or when you're at home. Mm -hmm. So that is the support system can actually grow and be more stronger for you, mm -hmm. but it, it can also diminish. People, the friend, friends can leave you, friends can disappoint you. True. All this happen, they're realities. Mm -hmm. And you know, everybody has a reason for being with you during your moment of difficulty. Mm -hmm. Some of them want to support you genuinely. Some of them want to learn from you, your own journey. Some mm -hmm. of them want to connect more with you. Mm -hmm. Some of them find it really difficult. They find, it, because people are different. Somebody can be overwhelmed. Hey, Maze Omondi is going through a lot. I, mm -hmm. I'm so, because I had a lot of friends who couldn't come to visit me because mm -hmm. they, they, find, they find it really difficult when they saw me in bed, oh, bedridden, yeah. Yeah. you know, in coma for days mm -hmm. it, it actually made them really emotional right so i understood that part but i also i felt grateful because my journey was now attracting people mm -hmm. that are going through challenges that are different on their own like unique to their own lives mm -hmm. it could be cancer it could be another disease it could be just just general life difficulties and i i i, I found gratitude in that mm -hmm. right now um, cancer treatment and management of course comes with a lot uh, of uh, baggage of uh, the treatment fee, uh, the, the cost, yeah. it's very expensive. How did you go around this? Well, I, I would say I'm lucky because at then I was still, under, uh, still, I was still covered by my grandmother's uh, insurance. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, for most people, they start from scratch. People mm -hmm. don't have an NHIF, they mm -hmm. don't have any form of insurance. Mm -hmm. They don't have any source of income. Mm -hmm and they're struggling with other aspects of their life. So when they get the, the diagnosis, they're wondering, now how do we do this? Because the drugs are expensive, mm -hmm. the treatment plan is expensive, and it takes a toll on your mental health, it takes a toll on your physical health, so that you can't even go to hassle, so that you can fend, fend for the, the, the doctor's fee and, and the x-rays and all that. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I think I was lucky. I consider myself lucky at least. Mm -hmm. But it got very bad because after, after some time when I, was, when I hit 25, I couldn't be covered by my grandmother anymore because of age. Yeah. Yeah, so that means we had to depend on well wishes and donors and, and doing fundraising here and there mm -hmm. so that we can support the treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think also that's, that's, that's a story for many cancer survivors. They do a lot of fundraising here and there. Yeah. They, they look for well wishes, family members, friends support them. So I also, that's, that's also my journey. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, at some point uh, I saw you, you had to go to India for, right. for treatment. Right. How was it? Uh, how did people come around for you? Mm -hmm. And how was the treatment and then coming back and mm -hmm. requiring to go for the phase two? Mm -hmm. how is the situation now we, going to India was a very it's, it's a journey it didn't just happen because in 2015 when my cancer started to spread through the body it spread to the bones and and and, and the brain mm -hmm. uh, I kind of lost hope I had exhausted everything literally everything I had I lost a house so I was imagining and I was actually actually I also deferred for the third time mm -hmm. so I was a very dejected young person I, I thought in all this world, where can I go? Mm. I said, actually, at this point, were you hustling? Yeah, I was still hustling. I was actually, actually working. I was, work, I was working with Chase Bank. Chase Bank had just entered into the market, the Kenyan market. Oh. So we were young, uh, young, young interns within Chase Bank. Mm -hmm. But now I couldn't work anymore. Oh, yeah. And you are having treatment. Mm -hmm. And you're still struggling. I want to do classes again. And because I was, do, I was doing two classes then, then during, during 2013 and 14. Mm -hmm. So when I sort of felt like I was exhausted, I, I, I said, I'm going home. I'm going back home to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. 
And to be honest, I felt like I had lost hope. Okay. And I always tell people at that point, losing hope is not like you, you, you don't, you don't, losing hope is more like you don't imagine a life outside your current mindset. Mm -hmm. For example, you, lo you lose a child, right? Mm -hmm. It was your only child. Mm -hmm. and now, you don't imagine that you might get another child. You don't imagine that this new child could give you even a better joy or a better opportunity as a parent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're stuck within that mindset. Mm -hmm. So that is the place I was in 2015. I was like, it is over for me now. There is, I'm just waiting for it. Actually, I said I was waiting for my death. Mm -hmm. So I went home and I said, whatever will be, will be. Mm -hmm. But you know, life is very funny. Life does not happen the way you imagine it. Yeah. I just struggled with it. There was no medication. I was not going for my clinics. I was just basically living my life in the village, mm -hmm. just struggling with my grandmother who used to cook for me, uh, wash me. I was basically bedridden in a wheelchair. It was difficult, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So during that process, we used to get a lot of prospects like, should we try something else? Mm -hmm. But now we were wondering, if you were to try something else, we need resources, we need money, we need people, mm -hmm. all right? I already have people. People is the first resource anybody has. Whether you're dealing with mental, mental health, whether you're dealing with you know, education, whether you're leading any aspect of life, people is the first resource. Mm -hmm. So I already have people. I already have people in my corner. I already have friends or people who can donate money and, and you know, just build up Kidogo Kidogo till we get that money that we need for, for treatment. Right. But I was also still afraid because I'd done a series of fundraising. So there's a time where you feel you feel guilt, you feel shame, ashamed to ask for more money from yeah. your friends and support system. Yeah. But uh, eventually, you know, for you to leave, you have to put you down your pride and then accept that, you know, you're vulnerable, you need help. Right. And help can come from people. Mm -hmm. So that is the point also when the idea of going to India came up. And uh, we, sought, we sought consultancy with a hospital in India, Apollo Hospital in India. Mm -hmm. And they drafted our, our fee and we said uh, 4.7 million is not so high, we could get it. Mm -hmm. So we, we, done, we did a, few, a, a series of fundraising and the most remarkable one, I think you saw it, it's what, it was tagged, we will win. Mm -hmm. So when I was thinking about it, I thought at some point I cannot be selfish with my story. My story mm -hmm. now belongs to a lot of people because a lot of people are invested in it. Mm -hmm. So I thought of we and then I said will because I was still hopeful. The hope yeah. was coming back to me, Pole Pole. I was to. now imagining a future that is possible, whether I'm still sick, but I can still do things, one or two things about my life. Right. And then win is just, you know, surviving and, and, and just, it's not just the disease going away, but mm -hmm. surviving with the disease, despite the disease. Yeah. So we will win. That is the tag that we did in 2016. And uh, it was run by artists mm -hmm. and uh, former colleagues at the University of Nairobi. When you say artists, are they the musicians or artists, poets, draw? visual artists? Like I told you, I'm a poet uh, and, and uh, I also paint mm -hmm. for therapy. So all this community of artists in Nairobi came up to, 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 to run the tag and we did the fundraising in 2016. Mm -hmm. That is the fundraising that enabled me to travel to India for my phase one treatment. All right. Yes. I, I hope you have a piece for us if you're a poet before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a writer. I'm just, I write only. Oh. I don't perform, yeah. All right. Now, uh, let's talk about one of the issues that has been affecting people with their chronic conditions, yes. stigmatization, yes. and maybe being mistreated. Yeah. Uh, how has your case been? Well, it's, it's very difficult because <laughs> I think stigma happens almost to every other person. It could be subtle, like very low-key, very hidden, mm -hmm. or indirect, or it could just be direct. Mm -hmm. I had both. Mm -hmm. At some point when I was diagnosed, uh, a close relative of mine told me, you know, liver cancer has very poor prognosis. Prognosis is how they, they envision how your life would be. Like if most people have a life expectancy when you're diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So for liver cancer, it's never more than five to seven years. Mm -hmm. And that can go down depending on your stage and depending on the general profile of your body. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I had that, this is somebody who is a relative who is very close to me. Mm -hmm. They sort of, they are obliged to at least give you some hope, you know? Mm -hmm. So when they told me that, I felt like they didn't believe I would heal any, at all, you know? Mm -hmm. And then also the losing of friends here and there, mm -hmm. that, affect, that really affects you because you, you, you imagine, you want your friends to be there for you. Mm -hmm. You also want to be there for them, even, even if it's a little, a little way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that also, I think also the idea that, you know, you are a young person and you have cancer, mm -hmm. there's a way cancer affects your body, it eats you. Like those days I was not this, this, this big or this, this healthy. Mm -hmm. I was very thin, mm -hmm. you know, and you're losing your hair. 
So people are wondering what, what's up with this guy, you know. Mm -hmm. For those who, do, we, who don't already know your story, so yeah. there's the avoidance. There's, yeah, there is yeah, misconceptions about it, mm -hmm. and that that is can, that, that's very difficult. That's very difficult, too, obviously. And then also the other thing is the stigma can happen in a lot of ways. It's like economical stigma, like cancer only affects rich people, mm -hmm. which is not the case. Right. We have very young young kids like you know, three, four, oh, newly, new, new, newborns. Newborn, have we have cancer. older people, 80. We have people like me who's 19, like mm. middle age 40. It affects everybody, whether you're poor, rich, small, young, and all that. All right. So those, that, that's also a way uh, that stigma manifests itself. Mm. Yeah. Now, nine years down the line, you mm. have managed to stand amidst the storms. Mm. Uh, even in this stigma, we mm. have people who don't know how to go around being stigmatized. Mm -hmm. They will break down on anything they hear. Mm -hmm. How are you able now to manage yourself? First of all, I think, like I told you before, cancer, when you're diagnosed, it, it's just more like grief. It's like you're grieving somebody or you're grieving yourself. So the biggest step for me that helped me, I think it could also be very helpful for many people, is acceptance. Mm -hmm. You have to accept your situation. Right. And you don't have to ask yourself a lot of why, like why me? Okay, you're allowed to ask during the initial stages of your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But after that, just get back on your feet very, very fast. Because acceptance goes a long way in terms of, in terms of being realistic. You, you're realistic because I have a disease. One, mm -hmm. this disease, what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. We can do treatment. Do I have the money? I don't have the money. What, who, who, can, who can help me? Do I, can I solicit for friends, you know, funds from friends? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can do that. So all these things are possible ways of looking at your life without getting stuck that, oh, I, I'm stuck, I cannot go anywhere. There's always help out here. And mm -hmm. you know the way Kenyans, you know Kenyans are very strange people. We fight a lot, but mm -hmm. there is a very beautiful spirit of Kenyans they come and show up for you, mm -hmm. all right? Whether you are from a different tribe or from another, another economical group, mm -hmm. they, they show up for you. And Kenyans have shown up for me. Right. And some of them, I don't even know them by name, you see? Mm -hmm. So it's very possible that if you have a genuine case that needs help, you can always be helped. True. I think a lot of people get stuck when they feel help cannot come. Yes, when you seek help, there are a lot of things that will come. People will not believe you. People will stigmatize you, mm -hmm. people will mock you, people will ridicule you. That, that's, that happens. We are all humans. Mm -hmm. And that is very normal for, for anybody who is seeking help. They always say when you're vulnerable, like imagine you're a child. Mm -hmm. You're a child who you depend to be fed, you depend to be clothed and bathed. You're very vulnerable. That is the point like for any cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. So for you to accept help, you have to accept that you are vulnerable. You need that help. Right. And then also, you, it's very good to actually seek therapy because therapy helps you ground yourself within yourself and also around the environment that you live in. Mm -hmm. And then also be very, be very deliberate with your treatment plan. Ask questions for your doctors. Ask them, what, what will this do for me? Mm -hmm. This medicine that you're prescribing for me, how will it affect my body? How we will, will, how, for how long will we do this treatment plan? You see that? Mm -hmm. Most patients are not knowledgeable about their disease or their treatment plan. Right. But if you are, if you understand, it's just like when you go into a football pitch, you know exactly where your position is and your, what, what, what function you're playing within that field. Right. So the same thing with knowledge about your disease, it helps you ground yourself, it helps you understand more what you can do. Because at the end of the day, the doctors only do a very small portion. When you go back home, there is the diet, there is how you take care of yourself, there's your mental health, there's how you affect other members of your family or support system, yes. Mm. Yeah. All right, uh, now, um, you have uh, spoken of the people standing with you. Yeah. Now, you decided to give back to the society by creating awareness. Yeah. I have seen uh, a number of uh, platforms you have tried to create awareness. Yeah. How has that been for you and how is the reception out here? Well, first, uh, we have to go back to the point where I was still ashamed, still not very ready to go public with my story. Mm -hmm. So I went public with my story in 2015. And then 2016, we did the fundraiser. That is actually the, the, the prime time of my opening about my story. And many people were sort of really, really shocked because they couldn't imagine how I held it together for those years mm -hmm. without many people realizing. So that actually uh, revitalized my advocacy and campaigns. Mm -hmm. And that was also the point where I also joined many cancer organizations, Africa Cancer Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, we also created Kisumu Cancer Foundation uh, with a friend of mine, I don't know whether, I think a lot of people know him, Jadudi. He passed on last year. Mm 
So we, we, we were young people when we were, we, we were joining for, to, to create Kisumu Cancer Foundation. Mm -hmm. We thought a lot of young people were getting diagnosed. Mm -hmm. During that time, we were, we were learning of, of, of a very significant statistic. A lot of young people were getting diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And young people find it difficult, like we did when we were diagnosed, mm -hmm. all right? Find it difficult to open up about their story. Mm -hmm. But it's the same story when you share it out. The story does not now belong to you. It belongs to a lot of people who find inspiration in your story, mm -hmm. who find resources, who find insight. Because, when you, for example, if I'm diagnosed now, and then maybe one day you come to me and tell me, Omondi, uh, maybe a cousin of mine or a friend of mine is diagnosed. What could we do? Mm -hmm. Already I know a few things during my journey that could be helpful for your case. Right. So that is exactly what prompted me to start advocacy. And then also, I used to blog a lot. I used to have a website that I could share my story from my journal during my treatment plan. Mm -hmm. And then that was very good because I, I, I saw a lot of positivity from the responses I was getting. Mm -hmm. I was getting invited to hospitals to talk to young patients. Right. Uh, we were doing campaigns all over the country through this organization, ACF and, and KCF. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I also partnered with uh, Kijabe Hospital, the pediatric ward, to teach the kids how to paint, mm -hmm. the kids who are going through cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those actually, in as much as I was also giving back to the society, they also opened up my story to them. Mm -hmm. They allowed me to heal further because I told you healing is not just about the disease going away. It's also yeah. about the fulfillment you get from your life, that True. it has some purpose, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, who are you partnering with? And the stakeholders and maybe the government, do you think they are doing enough to ensure the cancer management, mm. uh, the treatment, mm. we've been having calls to have every, uh, maybe uh, the machines, other than going to India or mm. any other country to be treated, we can have that here. Do you think enough has been done? I don't think it has been done, but the thing is, in Kenya, there's a unique, there's a unique problem. We have a very brilliant, a very, a very beautiful strategic plan for cancer. I don't think many people do, do know about it. We also have a parliamentary act that is supposed to help mitigate the cancer, right. all right? So we have calls to make cancer a national disaster. I don't think we need that. We need to enact and enforce mm -hmm. the, 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 the issues that were raised within the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. If we can implement those issues, then we have, we have a long shot at actually defeating cancer in this country, mm -hmm. right? We have, uh, we have, we have, we have, we, I think it's, it's very common to hear people say we need a special cancer, cancer hospital in Kenya, at least maybe even five or, or, or at least in every county, mm -hmm. all right? These are things that are enforceable. They're not, they're not far-fetched. We can do them because we have the resources. Mm -hmm. And I think also we, we need to accept the fact that the government has not really done so well in terms of health in general. Mm -hmm. Right now when COVID happened, that is now the moment we realize how exposed, how, how, how defeated, how broken down the health the healthcare is, is at the country. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot that is supposed to be done, but it's also important to know that campaign and advocacy has opened the voices mm -hmm. and has, 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 has enabled us to know what exactly we need to do. Mm -hmm. We need to we need to build a robust public health care mm -hmm. because previously we didn't know that something as simple as spitting on, on the street could be detrimental to another person's health. Mm -hmm. This is something that COVID is exposing. So the thing about cancer for the past 10 or, 10 or so years, it has been exposing our vulnerability, what we need to address. Mm -hmm. So we need, we, need, we, need, we need more remuneration for the doctors. Mm -hmm. We need more training. We need more specialized training for, because cancer, it's very hard to defeat it but just a general practitioner of a doctor or an MD. Mm -hmm. We need specialized care. Mm -hmm. So this means we have to go back to training so that we train our doctors, oncologists who are actually dedicated to cancer, cancer treatment, mm -hmm. and then nurses, uh, and nurses, and then maybe radiologists who actually do the imaging. Mm -hmm. And then we need at least maybe, like we have like renal healthcare for kidney, you know, mm -hmm. we need also specialized cancer wards. If it's not maybe a wing within, like for example, in, in KNH, mm -hmm. maybe we can have a whole hospital dedicated to cancer. Mm -hmm. These are things that will enable us to cut down, you know, uh, medical tourism where people travel to Europe and Germany and India to seek treatment that can be done locally, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. So I think as much as the government is trying because health sector is one of the most crucial areas of, of a country, mm -hmm. and the government has really tried to fund it, give it more funding than other sectors. 
I think there is mo there's, they need to be good with good political will mm -hmm. because we see every other time when, when, when challenges happen, we see politicians flying abroad to have their treatment. True. That, does that mean that we do not have doctors who can, could do the same treatment here? Mm -hmm. Of course we do. We have very brilliant doctors around, all right? Mm -hmm. And we could also like build hospitals, you know, dedicated to these issues that are affecting us. Mm -hmm. And we could also focus more on primary health care because the moment you neglect is like, you know, building, I don't know, it's like there's something fascinating, like for example, for, about Nairobi, we build a lot of skyscrapers, mm -hmm. uh, but deep down we still have ghettos, we still have slums, right? Exactly, yeah. So primary health care is very important in terms of mitigating cancer. So that, for example, when I was at home in 2015, mm -hmm. I used to go to a dispensary in Kilemewa San on a, on a pain, mm -hmm. and I would only be given paracetamol, maybe five. They are right? of, of course, paracetamol <laughs> is very ineffective for cancer pain, all right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm imagining a situation where we have a very robust p primary health care, where the dispensary can, can, can follow referral to a point where if they need, if they, if they feel like they cannot handle you, they refer you to the next level. Mm -hmm. If that next level cannot handle you, they refer you to a next level. Mm -hmm. Until they come to a national referral system. Now, that's where they, they need a speci specialized facility. Now, if they, they have to, of course, review your profile and see what do you need a specialized care, mm -hmm. now they refer you to a specialized care. True. This can only happen if you have a, a good primary health care system. Well, that's a good message. I'm, I'm hoping it has gone out there and people have had. As, as we finish, yeah. allow me to ask you this question yeah. for, the, for the sake of me and uh, someone who is watching nine right. years down the line. Right. How are you right now? Uh, <laughs> that's a very difficult question to ask, <laughs> but I think I, I am grateful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful because it could have been worse, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't become selfish with my story. Mm -hmm. I shared it and I continue to share it. Right. The days that I feel I shouldn't share it, I feel overwhelmed, but I still pick up myself and say, this story is not mine alone. I have to just reach out to more people. Mm -hmm. Well, the cancer came back last year. I went on a remission. Remission is where you go to a, a point where the cancer is not there. Or they do a scan mm -hmm. and they, they tell you you don't have cancer. So I, I went through that after 2017, after I came back from India. Right. So the cancer went into remission and then it came back last year. So right now I'm doing treatment again, chemo mm -hmm. and radio. And uh, I'm, I'm at a better point than, you know, I could have been like 10 or so years not back here. Yeah. Okay. You all have come. I'm giving you 30 seconds. This is your camera. Uh, tell the people out there one thing they need to know and maybe make a call to stakeholders and the government like you have mentioned. Well, this is for everybody who is like going through cancer. Cancer affects a lot of people, the patient, the caregiver and the support system. I think love goes a long way in terms of how we manage cancer. We need to really be more deliberate with our love. We do not need to stigmatize people further than they already are. When somebody is diagnosed, they're already vulnerable. So stigmatizing them further, I think that, that sort of affects them in a very negative way. So I'm, I think I'm really appreciating everybody who is doing anything that they can to support cancer patients, to be a caregiver. The, the doctors, the nurses, the hospitals, the parents, the siblings, that is a really commendable job that you're doing. It's not something that can be worn by one person alone. So I think this is where we need, we need you know, co-advocacy, we need voices, we need support, we need resources. So we do not suppose, we're not supposed to just leave it to the government or leave it to the hospitals or leave it to the person who is surviving it. We need to come together and, and talk more and have the conversation, keep the conversation going because through the conversation we get to expose the weaknesses. We also get to learn about our strengths. I think also this is a call to the government to enact the issues that they raised within the strategic, the, the na National Cancer Strategic Plan of 2012. Um, if we do that, we are going to, we are going to, we are going to be able to manage one of the most devastating diseases in cancer. Cancer is like the third leading cause of death in in, in Kenya. So I think if we are able to to be more open, to be more more honest, politicians have a lot of you know you know, ways of promising people year in, year out, but there's nothing that is really done. So I think it's, it's, it's a call for implementation. It's a call for actual implementation. If we do this, we are not only, because when we build a hospital or when, when, we, when we fund the Ministry of Health, when we, we bring in more, 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 more medication, 
uh, when we, we, we build, when we diversify NHIF so that it can accommodate at least the whole population, when we bring in universal health care, these are things that not only affect the cancer patient, it now goes to affect the whole health in general. And I think we also need to be a healthy nation as, as a, in general. We need to be more, more healthy, we need to be more positive with each other. We need to cast out tribalism and all that because all these things tend to, you know, affect us negatively and put, put us on hold when we should be supposed to be more uh, further in, in life. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Siongezi mm wala -hmm. sipunguzi. Uh, you've had the message. Right. Thank you so much, you. Uh, Omoni, for coming and telling us your story. I'm sure it has impacted someone out there and they, they have uh, been made strong. They know they will overcome, not even in cancer, even right. other conditions. They right. know uh, there's a victory in the end. Mm -hmm. I, I wish you very well and I know you will come out again and you will share your story to continue encouraging someone else. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Back home for Kim Pickens Company. He is uh, Omondi Ochuka. I'm calling him a uh, cancer ambassador. He has made it and he will make it still. So keep following him. Actually, you should have told us your social media platforms. People can follow you. All right, just, just follow me on Facebook. Most, that's where I mostly blog these days. Okay. Omondi Ochuka is, is my name. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now, coming up next is politics. Let's hear about the uh, commission allocation on revenue to the counties. Primary health is important. Is that being uh, cited? We will talk about that in a few minutes. We take a very short break and end this conversation. Goodbye.